I'm Deanna DeCaveries from songwritinglessonsonline.com and in this video I'll be going over the biggest game-changing tips for improving your lyric writing whether you're starting out and you're beginning with lyric writing or whether you've been writing for a while but you want something new to inject into what you're doing and I'll also be looking at the most harmful misconceptions around writing lyrics. If you're starting out with songwriting or you want to start out with songwriting one of the most important things is to get your mindset straight. So to begin with We'll look at a few of the commonest myths about lyric writing that can hurt your creativity. So the most destructive misconception is the idea that creativity or successful creative results are going to come at a huge personal cost. For example, you will need to be emotionally tortured in order to produce meaningful work and to write compelling lyrics. So the angst ridden artist who's articulating their turmoil is a really deeply rooted stereotype and an archetype. I personally know a songwriter who used to joke that they needed to create drama in their personal life in order to have things to write lyrics about, except that there's a part of that that wasn't a joke because that is exactly what they did. And of course, if any part of you believes that you might have to trade in your piece for producing something compelling, that's like a pretty enormous price to pay and it's quite off-putting. It may seem obvious that we would know that an archetype is an exaggeration often and it's not necessarily true but they still contain a lot of energy we can know something to be not really rationally true and yet that idea can nonetheless have this double life in our psyche in which we recognize that it's exaggerated but it still affects us there's this video about ed sheeran that does the rounds on social media from time to time and it's a series of slides with comments about his life path and the things that he's done and where he's come from. And the slides are accompanied with this stirring heroic music. And one of the slides says something about him being, him working his way up from the grassroots, him uh, not having very much money and at one point sleeping on a bench or retrieving some food from a supermarket bin. And I'm not speaking to the veracity of that or not. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, maybe that is a thing that happened. But Ed Sheeran has worked very hard for what he's able to do. And he had, his parents would drive him to open mics when he was 14 in the same way as tennis parents might drive their kids to tennis matches. So it wasn't the fact that maybe he was struggling for cash at one point and whether or not that's true, which is significant. The, the trade he made in order to build his skill was that he invested a lot of time. Not that he had to sleep on park benches. So stories like that, are very unhelpful in perpetuating this idea that if you're going to do something creative successfully, there's going to be a lot of struggle involved and a lot of scarcity and deprivation. And basically everything is going to have to be on the altar of all comforts, emotional, physical, financial, are going to have to be sacrificed on the comfort of achieving or exploring anything on a creative level. So even if we don't fully believe it, there's still that kind of little, that's a bit of that hanging around. And if we want to know why this kind of idea is so seductive, it's because the drama makes a good story. It makes a good story that people are going to watch to have all these slides of Ed's heroic rise and graft and what he went through set to the stirring music. It doesn't make a good story to say, well, you know, he, he worked really hard in various different ways methodically for a long time. Incremental does not make a good story. Media is designed to entertain us and creating drama is a way to do that. But there's another part that's seductive about it too, which is that if we believe that a given outcome is dependent on doing things that it's not reasonable to expect ourselves to do or to experience things that it's not reasonable to ask of ourselves, it kind of gets us off the hook of starting and investing sustained effort. You know, if something's just too far away, we're never going to get there, there's no point starting. And that in turn protects us emotionally from feeling like we tried something and, and we, we didn't measure up. And it's part of our brain that is trying to protect us from disappointment. And in some ways, it is easier to be able to invest in an idea that you could hypothetically be fulfilled by doing something and that that possible outline, that possible solution exists rather than if you do that thing and then you end up disappointed and now you have to let go of that as being a possibility. Now it's a failed solution. So our brain tries to protect us from that too. But that produces a cost, which is the sorrow of not having explored or fulfilled something it's a false protection that's going to generate over time sadness about things that did not get to be explored or did not get to come into being 
And when we think about it rationally, we can see that. But whilst it, anything like this lurks unexamined, it's something that can constrain us and sap our motivation without us being fully aware. So those myths are very damaging. But the most damaging, if I had to pick one, is the idea that you either got it or you haven't. Either creative and talented or you're not. Because what that means is that if you get into a problem or you get stuck or you can't do something or you make something that's not very good one day, maybe it's a sign that you don't got it. And this is, you know, this kind of idea is promoted by talent shows. You know, they tend to create the impression of a spontaneous talent and there being some sort of mystical component to the skill that the contestants may show. And it's an inevitable part of promoting an artist or a band that some kind of specialness will be invested in them. And as fans, we quite enjoy investing our favourite artists with specialness. But this can create a false perception in us that there's this enormous gap between their abilities and their rights to undertake creative activities and their legitimacy and our possible future results and our possible legitimacy. And someone who is starting out with lyric writing and songwriting and doesn't see the many stages that the work their favourite artists has gone through can attribute sort of magic to it where it's actually just methodical exploration. So those are the most harmful myths. When it comes to the things that the biggest game changes that I wished I'd known when I was a beginning lyric writer, I'm going to tell you three lyric writing elements that were most significant for me. So first off, and this might sound very odd, but it truly was a big game changer when I learned that there was such a thing as lyric writing technique. There were such things as guidelines and principles. There was a path already. Realising that there were frameworks I could use to define what it was that was working about my lyric. Or, or even that there was such a thing as being able to evaluate whether a lyric works and is fit for purpose. And aside from whether you like it or don't like it, that was a massive game changer. That such a thing even exists. And then using those frameworks to revise successive drafts of lyrics and realising that was a completely standard part of the process. I had no idea. I wrote lyrics for years before understanding that was a normal thing. It is possible to write good or even great, even a great song without being totally fully aware of what, what is making its work, without really knowing what's going under the hood. But it is also possible to learn more about what's going on under the hood and to understand that in quite a lot of detail. So I spent years writing songs without really having any parameters with which to evaluate them. But those parameters exist. And even understanding that was a big sort of game changer in my terms of my perception. It's not just all random. There are some objective principles you can learn and apply that will guide you to a higher level of craft with lyric writing. And you can do that from the very beginning. You don't need to spend 10 years randomly trying to write good lyrics like I did. And sort of having nothing to go on apart from your own response or that of other people with which to evaluate them. Okay, something else that it's useful to know if you want to write lyrics in your beginning is it is not just you. Discovering that Pretty much all of the creative struggles I had with lyric writing and songwriting over the years weren't just a reflection of my ability or lack of. They weren't unique to me. They're completely standard. It's a bit like if you walk a uh, flight of stairs and you carry on walking and you walk enough stairs, you're going to be out of breath at the top. That's not unique to you. That's like everybody. The standard challenges that are inherent to the form that most people who write songs will encounter at some point. And there are ways to overcome these challenges. There are good, helpful ways to overcome these challenges. So that was a big game changer. However, the, the things that the solutions and techniques that can really help and really add to what you do are not things that you can just easily deduce or work out simply by writing a lot of songs. You might fathom out some things, but there's loads more there. That would be like trying to invent maths, the field of mathematics every single time. So I know songwriters and signed artists with record deals and release schedules and tours whose approach to creating their next album is to basically hope for the best and hope they come up with something their fans will appreciate. And no matter how many times they do this, it's going to be hard for them to extract all of the first principles that already exist for working with language and narrative. Just like it would be really hard to invent science again. You know, we, you can build on it, but there wouldn't be any point doing that either. It wouldn't make you a better scientist. So you can be a beginning lyric writer or someone who's been writing songs for 15 years, but if you never bring anything else into the process, you might not necessarily write better lyrics just because more years have passed. 
I've coached songwriters who had studio time booked and they were panicking about how they were kind of come up with material because no matter how long they'd been writing songs, the way they went about it was the same. And it produced mixed results. The results were inconsistent. And that's quite stressful. If you've got to come up with something and you don't know if the results are going to be inconsistent or not, pretty fraught if every single time you start you're not sure quite how it happened or whether you'll ever be able to do that again. The next really big game changer for me was focusing on the on the fact that in a song lyrics give you information about meaning, people, places, things, and they also give musical information. And in both of those categories there are simple craft elements that we can learn and apply that make a difference straight away. So the meaning information includes the subject matter, how the ideas develop and progress through the song, the kinds of words and language that we're using to express the ideas, so what the subject of the story is or the song, and then how that's being described. Small adjustments to how you use the language can have really massive effects on what the listener receives from the lyric, and so can the way that you pace the information and what information you put into different sections of the song. I had not given this any consideration when I started out writing lyrics. But when you've got ways to pace material and develop it, you're much more likely to be able to finish songs, finish more of your songs, understand how to get unstuck. And as well as the way the topic develops during the song, the, there's the type of language that we're going to use to describe it. One simple idea that I use all the time now is categories of language. So categories of language means that out of anything that might be in your song, there are two main categories. One is going to be the world of things, places, people, external things that you could touch, see, hear, smell, taste. And the other category is going to be abstract things that you cannot touch, see, smell, taste. So I could taste a cupcake, I cannot taste time. So there's this abstract category, which is abstractions and emotions and then there's this con this category of things of the world so if you have a good balance between those two types of language your listener is going to remain more engaged there's going to be things for them to pay attention to and meaning delivered by the abstract language so that's not something I, I ever gave any thought to until I learned it the musical information includes the melody and the tune but there's also the rhyme scheme there are the stress patterns there's how long each line is, how many syllables each line is it, what the rhythm of the line is. And sometimes it might just take changing a three-syllable word to a one-syllable word for a line to sit comfortably and an entire section to work better and feel better balanced. And using your mood and emotional responses to your material as the main barometer with which to evaluate whether they're good or not or how they could be better is really vague and it's really hard. And it's not consistent. But once you start considering and refining and reviewing your material in terms of what kind of language you're using, how the idea is progressing across the sections, what the length of the line is, what the rhyme scheme is, what the rhyme sound is, now you've got a lot more to go on and you can review and edit things and you've actually got something concrete you can address when, it, when, when you're doing revisions. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, that sounds like a lot of things. Meaning, development, use of language... Melody, sound, rhythm, rhyme scheme, rhyme sound, that sounds like a lot to get across. I'm pretty overwhelmed just even realising those things exist. So yeah, I found some of these ideas took a bit of repetition to take on board to begin with, but the truth is that you can become comfortable with some of them and use them to inspire and enrich and adjust your writing in a lot less time than you might think. The best way that you can start widening and deepening your understanding is to apply these ideas in practice in manageable ways, train yourself to use them with writing activities and familiarise yourself with them one at a time. And in this free ebook, I go into more detail on what the categories of language are, how powerful the effect on it is and why, why we respond to different categories of language in a different way. I explain how to think about sequencing the content and the ideas in your material. I go into how you can use lyrics from songs you already love to develop yourself and how to most effectively take an idea and turn it into a lyric. There's a writing calendar and a selection of prompts and activities for you to do to extend your understanding of how you get to use new ideas successfully. So even if you just read it, it's going to switch on some major light bulbs 
And if you use the writing prompts and do any of the activities, you're going to get further benefits from it and improvements. So it's a great place to start with lyric writing for beginners. But if you've written lyrics and songs for a while and haven't really developed your creative process very much beyond experimentation, there are also ideas that can profoundly extend what you're doing and how you're doing it and what's available to you as a songwriter.